The WNBA season begins today, and we'll get you up to speed with the Athletics' Ben Pickman. Plus, we have a new reported NIL record for a college basketball player, and the order for the NBA's first two-day draft is set. It's Tuesday, May 14th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. Great Osabor has committed to transferring from Utah State to Washington State, and in the process, he may have just changed college basketball. The 21-year-old, who was born in Spain and went to high school in England, is believed to have secured $2 million in NIL deals along with the transfer. That would give him, in his final year of college eligibility, more earnings than some NBA players are making. As a foreign athlete, Osabor may be limited in the types of deals he can accept. It depends what type of visa he has, among other factors, but apparently none of that was a particularly significant roadblock in this case. While NIL figures are not openly reported, the way professional contracts are, this is likely a new high watermark for college basketball. Regardless, it shows what is now possible for a highly regarded college basketball player. Osibor is the first $2 million college basketball player that we know of, but he likely won't hold that distinction for long. All the other top recruits and transfer players now have a new target to aim for. The Atlanta Hawks secured the number one overall pick in the NBA draft. While there's no Wembenyama type prospect in this draft, it will continue the progression of top talent from France. The Hawks are projected to pick French center Alex Saar, and his countryman Zachary Rissacher is expected to join him inside the top 10. Mock drafts also put Serbia's Nikola Topic as an early pick along with two players from G League Ignite. If all that comes to pass, we would have five players from outside the NCAA picked in the top 10, and they likely won't be the only ones picked in the first round. This year, the draft will be broken up into two days with the first round on June 26th and the second the following day. The NBA is hoping that the extra day will allow for more trades as teams will have a chance to assess the field after the first round. There will also be a venue change with the first round at the Barclays Center in Brooklyn and the second at ESPN Seaport District Studios in Lower Manhattan. On day two, the big question could be who brings in Bronny. LeBron James's son was medically cleared to play in the NBA after suffering a congenital heart defect last year. While the favorite to pick him is his dad's team, someone else could jump the line in the hopes of inducing LeBron to opt out of his final year with the Lakers. I'm joined now by Ben Pickman, staff writer for The Athletic covering women's basketball. Welcome, Ben. Hey, thanks a lot for having me. Yeah, great to have you back on. Uh, So uh, just heading into the WNBA season, I'll just throw you the most general possible question. What are are your big narratives as, as at the outset of the season? I think there are two that a lot of people are kind of looking on. The first one heading into the season is just how will this rookie class do? This is, you know, maybe the most anticipated rookie class ever, um, certainly in a long, long time, led by Caitlin Clark, Angel Reese, the number seven pick going in the Chicago sky, Cameron Brink, who was a star at Stanford. There's so much talent kind of coming into this league and this really a transformational moment in the league that I think people are just really curious to see how they perform. The other one that I think will be talked more and more about as the season progresses is the Las Vegas Aces who are going for a three-peat which hasn't happened since you know the start of the league back in the late 90s and early 2000s so there could be you know one of the biggest dynasties best dynasties um, in the history of the sport and they have a chance to do something really historic Um, the U.S. Olympic team is going to feature likely four Las Vegas Aces so there's a lot of interest there and we'll see if they're able to pull it off uh, come October. Yeah yeah and the the Olympics being right in the middle should should be uh, just an interesting factor here. Um, uh, and yeah, well, actually, I'll get to the schedule in a bit. But uh, the WNBA is instituting charter flights for the entire league. They'll spend around $25 million per season this year and next, and presumably each year thereafter. Why was this a big deal for the players? It's a big deal because the player experience is really at a point that it has to be prioritized for the WNBA. Um, players really talk about it as a health and safety issue that – you know, they're putting themselves and their bodies at risk, and they're actually not performing up to their highest level because of some of the routes um, and travel circumstances that they have to go through. It's especially heightened, though, at this time, because there are even more security concerns than maybe there have ever been, right? Last year, Brittany Griner, um, the Phoenix Mercury Center, was harassed in an airport in Dallas on a road trip. Um, And that was, you know, an incident that, you know, people were hoping to avoid heading into the year and that charter flights would have presumably avoided or just would have made impossible because she wouldn't have been with the general public with the league continuing to attract more eyeballs with you know so much more attention on women's basketball now than really ever before these figures are recognizable and so you know getting these players out of public airports and away from 
you know, onlookers, potential people who might disrupt them um, and might alter their travel experience was so imperative. Now, I should say, we still don't know when the full charter program is going to go into effect, right? That's one of the things that is unclear about this situation. Kathy Engelbert, the WNBA commissioner said, they'll do it as soon as we can logistically get planes in place. So when will that be? Nobody is really sure. It looks like, you know, the WNBA season starts on Tuesday. They're still going to be flying commercial um, for that period of time or at least to open the season, it seems like. So we'll see when the full program comes into effect, but it was still certainly celebrated that this change is coming. Yeah, I mean, the timing of it was interesting in that, you know, all the the elements here were were in place before. So it feels, you know, a little up to the last minute if they're going to do it. I, obviously, I don't know everything going on behind the scenes, but this also felt like, the year where their hand is is as forced as it's ever going to be, you know, obviously with Caitlin Clark coming in. But yeah, they're just more recognizable players, more players who have been on national TV, who have gotten national attention, you know, the ones coming from college that you mentioned. Uh, and yeah, I think people are more aware of people like, you know, Brianna Stewart, Brittany Griner, um, Sabrina Ionescu. Um, I think there are you know, more and more people who, you know, can't go grocery shopping without without getting recognized. Absolutely. And I think it was one of these things that frankly surprised a lot of people around the league. You know, my colleague Sabrina Merchant and I, we checked in with a bunch of general managers on Tuesday when the news was coming out. And, you know, multiple said that they were not made aware of any changes to the travel plans prior to Engelbert's announcement. You know, teams around the league have their travel booked um, already, their flights booked for a right. season, <laughs> you know. And so there's going to have to be kind of a process to make some of those adjustments now that this change is again, pres presumably looming and coming this this year. Yeah, actually, since you mentioned that, I think I saw a clip of Brianna Stewart finding out at a press conference, like a reporter was asking her. And she's like, oh, really? Like, cool. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, so this sort of thing you, you expect to come like through the Players Association or something. Um, uh, so Charter Flights was one of the big, um, you know, big asks that players had, you know, when you talk to WNBA players and say, you know, what, what do you want? for this league uh, going forward, charter flights would always come up, but there are other things. Um, the one I've heard a lot is more roster spots. There's just not very many spots uh, for the, the amount of talent coming in. Uh, also better pay. Uh, what what are you hearing as kind of the, the next big domino to fall here? Yeah, I mean, so I can set it up this way. So this the WNBA CBA uh, could be up for negotiation very soon. Either side uh, has the ability to opt out of the deal this fall, and could which would then abandon the agreement at the end of the 2025 campaign. So there could be some renegotiation uh, coming up very soon. Some of the issues you mentioned, roster size is always one that is kind of discussed. Uh, teams you know, are limited really 12 or sometimes 11 players on a roster. So we'll see if there's any expansion there or just players who are kind of two-way player equivalents like you see in the NBA. Some other things that have come up, player salary increases. That is surely one that they're going to stress now that travel is presumably a little more taken care of. And obviously people will want to see continued increases in salaries, both for rookies and for max players, which pale in comparison to a lot of other male sport equivalents. Another one that was really important in the WNBA's most recent CBA for the players was the maternity policy. That's another policy that I expect that they'll make some adjustments on and continue to build upon and improve upon um, as a new agreement presumably comes into place if and when they new negotiate. One of the big things that is kind of looming all of over all of this, though, is the WNBA's impending media rights renegotiation. Um, its deal with ESPN is up after the 2025 season. Um, it has a number of other partners, Ion, CBS Sports, Amazons, that it broadcasts games on. Um, and so, you know, with more media rights, as we see, you're able to really increase salary uh, floors and salary ceilings, potentially. You can change the cap of an entire league, depending on how much money is coming in from those TV rights partners. So if they get the deals that they want in these upcoming negotiations, the league that is, then a lot of these issues could really change. Just the the momentum, the arrow of the WNBA could go even more up than it already is right now. Yeah, I mean, that feels like, you know, the we'll, we'll kind of know the the basic territory once once we get a look at the new media rights deal, whenever that happens. Um, so right now, the league is bringing in, the reporting is around $60 million per year. Um, I've heard Kathy Engelbert wants to at least double that. Um, and I think she's probably in a, a good position to do so. Um, anything you're hearing just about uh, the state of those those media rights and will they be bundled with the NBA as they have been? 
or is there some possibility that they split off? I think it is an answer of both that there will be some bundling, um, likely, you know, with ESPN as a partner, um, that is kind of what it is right now, the NBA as an entity as a whole kind of wants to own the global or the yearly basketball calendar and, you know, having the WNBA fill a lot of those summer broadcast windows does fulfill that objective. But like is the case right now, you know, the WNBA has some partners with you know, networks and services that the NBA doesn't rely upon. I mentioned it, Amazon, CBS and CBS Sports, Ion, which is a big player in the WNBA. They actually broadcast the most games nationally of any partner um, overall. So it's likely to encompass both linear television and streaming. We've also seen, you know, Warner Brothers Discovery, uh, reportedly uh, my colleague Mike Borkanov and I uh, at The Athletic, we reported that they have shown some interest in acquiring WNBA rights, and they actually just bought the rights to broadcast the league in the UK and in Ireland. So we'll see if that changes, even if um, the NBA loses out on the media rights negotiations that is going on right now. So I do expect it to be a combination, but again, like we'll kind of see what happens. But if they get the deal that they want, as I reiterated, just to reiterate it, so much could change in the outlook um, and you know the treatment of players around the league. Yeah, and WBD is an interesting player in there because obviously they want to keep the NBA, but they might lose the NBA to NBC. Uh, they've also gotten out of the regional sports network game for the most part, but they still have TNT for national broadcasts. So, uh, but it sounds like yeah, they still want uh, they still want in on on basketball generally. Um, but yeah, but either way, that's going to largely increase the. The, the pile of money that can go to the league and to players and yeah, how that gets divided up, I guess, will be kind of the central um, negotiating ground of the uh, of the next CBA. Do you do you get the sense that someone's going to opt out after the season or is it possible that they kick the can down the road one year? No, I think it is likely um, that they do. And it would just make sense to because the sport is booming and it is in such a different place than it was when the last CBA was agreed upon, you know, around a half decade ago. Um, and so with so much change, if you're both sides, you can really make, you know, significant adjustments to conditions. And if you're from the player perspective, like there's so much room to potentially benefit, especially on the financial side, as a new media rights deal um, comes into play. Yeah. And maybe kind of a random question for you, but I've been hearing some amount of chatter about just when the WNBA plays. It's I mean, they they take the part of the schedule where there isn't other basketball. Um, you know, it's the, the NBA is well, I mean, their playoffs are still going, but uh, that'll be wrapped up, you know, a little bit into the WNBA season. We don't have college is at the same time. It just feels a little weird to have to have this major league. Uh, playing summer basketball, even though there's no particular reason why they shouldn't play basketball in the summer. Anyway, do you think the summer schedule works for, for the WNBA or is any desire to, I mean, it would be a big undertaking, but to move things further into the fall? I think it would be pretty difficult to move things further into the fall and really shake up the schedule. I mean, think about the WNBA season and the footprint they have. Like they are using first and foremost, a lot of arenas that some NBA teams use, right? The New York Liberty, for instance, play at Barclays Center. They're, that arena availability drastically changes during the winter months when the Brooklyn Nets are in action. They're not alone. You know, the Los Angeles Sparks play in Crypto.com Arena, right? That is where the Lakers play and where the Kings play. And so that leads to some right. potential scheduling conflicts there as well. The other thing that is different in the WNBA context is a lot of these players still go play overseas and play internationally, right? You're competing with a kind of FIBA schedule, which runs in a more traditional NBA footprint, right? A lot of these European leagues in Turkey, in Italy, in the Czech Republic, in China, they're running, you know, October to March, October to April. So that makes it a challenge. One of the issues with moving it up is when moving it up into, you know, earlier in the spring and beginning the season earlier is how do you onboard these college players, right? The college right. footprint is November to early April. The draft for the WNBA is literally one week after the final four, two or three weeks after that, these rookies go to training camp and two weeks after that, they're starting a season. So the footprint there, the break there is really, really condensed. It does a disservice to the word break to even call it a break because yeah. it is such a quick <laughs> transition for both players and media alike, I should add. It is a quick transition for us in the press corps as well to go from one to the other. But it's hard to you know imagine them moving the season up to start in, say, March because how do you then bring players along? You know, are you bringing them in a month into the season rookies and like figuring it out and drafting based on 
you know, what you need there. Like that's a crazy hypothetical too. So, you know, the WNBA certainly I think does the most with, you know, the footprint and the schedule and the timing that it has. I would also add that this summer it's especially difficult because of the Olympics. And I know we mentioned that at the top of the conversation, but basically there's going to be a midsummer break for a few weeks during the Paris games. And so this year, more than last year, even there's an even more compressed schedule with more back-to-back games, more, you know, two games and three nights sequences. Um, It's why the travel issue and the resolution of it, or what looks like a resolution of it is especially important because the schedule is even more compressed than it has been in the past. Yeah. And yeah, this this will be a you know something of a unique year with that that summer break for the Olympics. Just anything that you're sort of thinking about, anticipating in terms of how that's going to interact with the league and its logistics, but also you know could this be a moment where um, where these players get you know a national stage, an international stage to you know further elevate uh, what a league that's already very much on the rise. Absolutely. I mean, I think it does certainly provide a national stage. And this is an Olympic team that, you know, has players who win the gold medal every single year in Diana Taurasi, who's been winning gold since the early 2000s. And it has, you know, a generation of stars and Brianna Storr and Asia Wilson, who are looking, I believe, for their third uh, gold medal each. Um, It's just an exciting time overall. And so many eyes will be focused on both women's basketball, men's basketball, all these other sports that it does provide them another platform to showcase their abilities um you know what it does if you're a WNBA team you're really hoping that there's no injuries or no health concerns that occur during the season um as a result or during the olympics um but it is just another time to showcase the global talent of the sport you know of so many sports and women's basketball being among them and before we let you go uh give us a team and a player to kind of keep our eye on in the season someone intriguing you you can't say the aces and you can't say caitlin clark but uh anyone else here like you know let, let this could be an interesting story as the season goes on. Sure. I would point to the Seattle storm. Uh, they were kind of the biggest, most active team over the off season. They added Neka Gumake, who's a former league MVP and Skylar Diggins Smith, who is a multiple time all WNBA uh, first team talent uh, guard via free agency. They've surrounded those two players have joined the franchise who already have Jewel Lloyd, who is, you know, one of the best and most dynamic guards in the whole league, a top five player in her own right. So they are kind of the new big three or big four, if you include their all-star center, Ezzy Magbagor, um, a team to watch for. And, you know, for business fans out there, they are a franchise who recently invested in their own facility. They just opened a brand new center for basketball performance, um, a state-of-the-art facility, a practice facility that has really everything you would want as a high-level professional athlete. So it's another ownership group that continues to invest in the product as well. All right. Sounds good. Ben Pickman, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Thanks a lot for having me. That's it for today. Very special thanks to Mac Montandon, who is leaving the FOS team to devote himself fully to obsessing over the Baltimore Orioles. Good luck with that, Mac. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>